I'd like to bid the church good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, we're going to be discussing some claims uh, of Islam, and uh, especially it's important because uh, they will bring uh, some of the writings of Moses into uh, view. And for that reason, I'd like to, uh, again, encourage our listening audience to, uh, from time to time, to uh, stop, maybe rewind, uh, take a pen and paper, uh, these kinds of things, and consult with God's Word. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Muslimin, island was island. Ismi ken free. Analay Muslimin, walaykin anatolab al Quran wa sunnah. La ilaha illallah al shadwan Ibrahim Rasul Allah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil alamin. Bismillah. We'd like to invite our Muslim friends as well to uh, take time to study, to contemplate, as we take very seriously some challenges posed by our Muslim friends about Jesus and Muhammad. I'd like to turn our attention to a statement in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, about Moses stating that there would be a prophet like himself that would come. Now in Islam, uh, many scholars would state that this is speaking of Muhammad. There'll be several analogies made because of the term like, like unto me. And they'll make argument that it is not Jesus because Jesus was not married. Jesus was not a head of state. Jesus did not take part in military campaigns as Muhammad did. But we're going to find from the scripture from the Bible that terms like thy brethren, that the Bible gives us these terms, and that no man and no group has a right to redefine these terms. We'll also study from God's word whether it is Jesus the Christ or Muhammad. And let's also uh, notice a few other facts as well. In both scenarios of the Quran, and of the Bible. Ishmael is mentioned, and we'll take note of that. And briefly, we'll make a case that, that the prophet, uh, also confirmed in the New Testament, we'll look at that as well, is Jesus the Christ and not Muhammad. And then we'll take some time with this and develop some thoughts, and then we'll open up to the floor for some questions and for some discussion about this important subject. I also want to state for the record that Islam is not original of those claiming that someone other than Jesus is that prophet in which the Commonwealth or the Hebrews were to look for. Uh, we have other groups like uh, Joseph Smith and our Mormon friends and some others that reinterpret what God had to say about the subject and basically developing a philosophy that would put in their mind their prophet in place of the Christ. So with that said, let's turn our attention to the Old Testament to see if these things be so. I believe I'm all wired in, so uh, I think our mic is just fine. Let's notice something. Moses said there was a time coming when a prophet like me would come. Now, Lord willing, our next session will be about Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, and also in Matthew chapter 5, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And a reason why that the words of Jesus would transcend, remember when Jesus was on the earth, asked questions about can a man put away his wife for any cause, Jesus is basically going to legislate. Why? He's like Moses. He is a law giver. A law giver. Very important. And thereby, when Jesus has something to say or makes a decree about marriage, then it is God who speaks. And thereby, we are to obey. Well, let's notice a few facts when it comes to this matter of the prophet like unto me. 
Was he speaking of Jesus or was he speaking of Muhammad? In Genesis chapter 17 and verse 20, now we know the story of Abraham. Abraham had two sons and they were promised. Remember that Abraham and Sarah would bear children long, long after those childbearing years. Something else we know that Ishmael was born, but from a chronological standpoint, he was born first. But let's think about this for a moment. In the New Testament, and, and let's set a little bit of a foundation, in the fourth chapter of the book of Galatians. And as we read uh, from this, we see an analogy. We see a picture that of, starting in verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. And of course, it, uh, Paul is going to describe uh, those that are trying to mix Judaism with New Testament Christianity will not fit. Why? Because it is Isaac. It is the, the son born by the free woman. And as we can determine this, Hagar was that of the bond woman. And she had a son, or a son, named of Ishmael. Hagar, of course, was a, a concubine, a, a somewhat of a wife of Abraham. So there's no argument that Ishmael uh, came through the lineage of Abraham, but he was not, nor his mother, that of promise. Let's also turn our attention, if we would, to the same chapter, chapter 17. Uh, we mentioned verse 20, but let's look at verses 19 to 21 to put in context, because when it was determined that through Isaac, that these blessings would occur and not through Ishmael. Remember, it was Abraham who raised up the name, who raised up his son, Ishmael, but God said that the covenant, the promise, would be through Isaac, not through Ishmael. Very important. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 25, verse 13, Muhammad can make a claim that he is in the lineage of Abraham through Kedar, and that by the lineage of Ishmael. But we're going to see that God is going to make a distinction between the descendants of Ishmael and Isaac. And Isaac. It's interesting to note, and to our Muslim friends, and it might surprise some of us if you have your Quran. In Surah chapter 29, verse 27, in Arabic, it would be uh, the Surah Ankabut, or Surah Ankabut. This is the spider, by the way. Chapter 29, verse 27, and you're going to find actually two names Isaac, or Isaac, Wa Yaqob, or Jacob. And it was through these that God would make prophethood through the Israelites, through the Hebrews, as we know as the Jews. It's an interesting thought that many Muslims overlook that even the Quran agrees more with what the Bible has to say than many Quranic scholars. And this is something that you should examine to see if these things be so. But now let's turn our attention back to the Word of God. Let's turn our attention back to the Bible. As a matter of fact, we, we mentioned Isaac and Jacob. In Genesis chapter 21 and verse 12, God was very specific when it came to Isaac and the blessings and the lineage. It would be in Isaac, not in Ishmael. Very important. Very important. I'd like to stop here because maybe some of us have not realized, or maybe we have and we've forgotten, that many Muslims and their scholars would state a reason to have the Qur'an is because the Old and New Testament has been defined. And many of the teachings and many of the truths uh, simply have not been preserved. But yet when we look at it from an, object, an objective standpoint, we find the Bible agreeing with itself. 
And we find all of these statements that always point toward Isaac and Jacob. This is, extreme, this is of an extreme importance when we look at the evidence of Scripture. So what is the preponderance of evidence then? Well, that God had chosen Isaac, even though we have a separate mother, and remember Isaac through Sarah, Ishmael through Hagar. But even in the New Testament, that there's that analogy, that picture, like the Old Testament law that was in bondage. Hagar was the picture of bondage. Sarah, of that of promise and of the New Testament. Also, Isaac and Jacob, God determined a particular group of people that would receive this lineage, this, this, this group. Remember in Genesis chapter 12, it would be through Abraham and his seed, his descendants, that God would ultimately bless all of mankind. And we understand this through the Christ, through Jesus. So in Islam, they'll call him Isa, Islam, Jesus of Islam. Ishmael, matter of fact, it is uh, our Muslim friends will state the Kaaba. That's something you probably see from time to time. And certainly during Ramadan, they'll have that. And they make a, a statement that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba. And in Arabic, Kaaba means cube, three-dimensional. And that for this reason, that people forgot God, but when Muhammad came back, or as you say, when Muhammad came on the scene, rather, then the Kaaba was restored. Well, we don't have any other types of evidence to point toward that fact. But we do have evidence that it is Isaac who would be chosen, and through his descendants, even though Ishmael would be a great people, but he was not the descendant that God had chosen, that all blessings, that all of the prophecy, that all of the law that would come in the prophets of God through this lineage, through Isaac and Jacob, ultimately to the Christ. Let's turn our attention also to the New Testament. Peter a, an apostle, as well as Luke, an inspired writer, so we have witness here, where Moses spoke of a prophet like unto him, we can determine and we can see how the Bible agrees with itself in the Old and New Testament that he's speaking of the Christ. He's speaking of Jesus and not that of Muhammad. If we have our Old Testament, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. We looked at verse 18 of, uh, of chapter 18, but let's look at chapter 17 and 18. Chapter 17, verse 15. Chapter 18, verse 2 of Deuteronomy. And see how God defines the term brethren. And the question is asked. Well, if Abraham is the progenitor of Ishmael and Muhammad through Kedar, that's chronicled in Genesis chapter 25, verse 13, well, why can't he be the promised one? It's interesting to note the use of brethren. These are all Semitic peoples. Not all would be brethren because why? Because the brethren would be through this lineage, through Isaac. In Jacob. This is the lineage that the Christ would come through, and thereby we can determine this prophet, this lawgiver, like unto Moses, would be like whom? Jesus the Christ and not Muhammad. Again, our for the most part, our Islamic friends and their scholars, they'll want to say and make the distinction like, right? That's a simile. When we use term like, and if we extend it, of course, it's a similitude, and even going beyond that, a metaphor, or some might even say an allegory. But yet, 
It's very specific here. We know that Jesus was not married. Muhammad was. We know that Moses was married. Jesus was not. But there are some other matters as well, important matters. And those of you who are in Islam must consider as well. Why? And again, if we say something that is contrary to your understanding, please contact us. We'd, we'd love to have a public discussion, even at a debate. But there's some matters here that need to be discussed. First and foremost, Muhammad makes the claim for the vast majority, and, and there's an exception here, and some think on the midnight ride into Jerusalem that Muhammad, uh, if, if he was, that was a vision or it literally occurred, but nobody argues the fact that Muhammad received all his revelation from one angel, Jabril, or Gabriel. There's a difference, a fundamental difference between Moses, who spoke to God. Remember the burning bush. God did, yes, there are times when God sent angels. We, we have this recorded in the book of Genesis, for instance, and in relationship to Abraham and the announcement that they would have a child long after their childbearing years. But when it comes to Moses, he received revelation directly from God. In the book of John, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And that's a translation. It literally means that God was face to face. This Word was face to face with God. When we talk about the life of Jesus, did Jesus say that the, the angels revealed unto him? No, he spoke of his Father. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So there's a vast difference between if we want to use the term revelation or transmission of inspiration because Moses received it directly from God. Jesus received it directly from the Father. But Muhammad received it where? From Jibreel, from Gabriel. Very important as we ponder such matters. So who was a, a prophet like unto me? And that doesn't even sound like Muhammad, does it? But that does sound like Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ. So in a nutshell, if we encapsulated all of the opinions and the philosophy of our Muslim friends that make the statement that, and we're going to look at one other, uh, Lord willing, in the future, where our Muslim friends, primarily their scholarship, make a philosophy that in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, that Muhammad is the paraclete and not the Holy Spirit. And this is extremely important, and why discuss it? Uh, we have a lot of young people that don't know their Bible. And they go to campuses. Also, there are outreaches. And facts are facts. And a matter of fact, facts are stubborn things, aren't they? And it doesn't matter if I overlook something or, or I have a... A, a, a mischaracterizing the truth, facts are facts, or other people. The fact is, is that Moses did make a prophetic utterance by inspiration that there would one be coming like unto him, a prophet like unto him. Those that say it's Muhammad, you have no, you have no evidence. Now some would argue the word like but see, God has already determined and defined the terms. Like your brethren. What brethren? Through Ishmael? No. Through Isaac or Isaac? Yes or not. So we can determine, we can be conclusive, we can argue in a debate or discussion, and the facts would be, and a correct conclusion, by inspiration, Acts chapter 3, verse 22, that it is Jesus the Christ who is a lawgiver like unto Moses, but not Muhammad, not Joseph Smith, not any other person in the past, in the present, or in the future, but is Jesus the Christ. Well, we've taken just a few moments to define a little bit of our terms, uh, discuss some cons. Now, what I'd like to do I'd like to open up to the floor for discussion. 